on this page. Stasha's upbringing instilled in her a profound love of nature and a passion for learning about plants, foraging, herbalism, and sustainable living, a journey spanning over 25 years. With a BS in agricultural education from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, and currently pursuing an MS, a master's in natural resources with a focus on agroforestry at the University of Missouri, Stasha's academic and practical experience is extensive. Her expertise includes prim primitive living techniques, forest farming, and wild mushroom identification, which she has taught at various educational institutions and through independent workshops, some of which some of the people who are on our, in our boot camp have already been a part of. Stasha's international exposure includes a year in Indonesia studying agriculture and soci sociology, enriching her understanding of global agricultural practices and community structures. And she just got back in Costa Rica um, where she did an Appalachian conference. Is that right? It's the North American Agroforestry Conference. North American Agroforestry Conference. And they decided would be in, in Costa Rica this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exchange of um, agroforestry knowledge between tropical and temperate agroforestry. Oh, wow. How interesting. And she is, lives in Piedmont, North, Carol uh, North Carolina, with her family and a, ver and a variety of animals. And she embodies the principles in, of sustainable and regenerative agriculture. Welcome, Stasha. And take thank it away. you. Excellent. Well, um, thank you for having me, Nikki. I'm um, pleased to be here and to share. Um, and I'm going to jump in and share my screen if that's okay. Oh, go right ahead. Let me stop sharing. Okay. And can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can see it. Okay. So um, again, my name is Stasha Warren. I'm an uh, agroforester with Appalachian Sustainable Development. And thank you so much for having me today, Nikki. Um, so Appalachian Sustainable Development uh, is an organization based out of Southwest Virginia. Um, and I'm just going to give a real quick pitch on ASD, uh, just since they are supporting me being here today. Um, Appalachian Sustainable Development, um, uh, and the, our goal is to transition Appalachia to a more resilient econ economy and healthier population by supporting agriculture um, while exploring new economic opportunities and connecting people for to healthier food. Um, I'm not going to go over the introduction because Nikki just did a great job doing that, so I'm just going to skip past that. And say I'm also a, um, a mother, wife, and community, community member. <laughs> so um, what is agroforestry? It is not a new uh, concept. It is a uh, ancient practice with indigenous roots. Um, and I always give a, a precursor by saying that many of us are practicing on indigenous grounds. I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, it is also a um, considered by the USDA to be climate smart practices, climate smart farming practices. This is um, very important to recognize, I believe. Um, agroforestry is the intentional integration of forestry and agriculture. Uh, so consider this like a word mashup of forestry and and uh, forestry and agriculture, agroforestry. It's trees and or shrubs mixed with um, crops and or livestock. And I'm just going to give a brief um, background on the agroforestry practices because forest farm is one of these practices. Um, so there in the United States, there are six federally recognized practices. Forest farming is one of them. There are riparian buffers, uh, forest farming, which we'll be discussing today, windbreaks, alley cropping, silvopasture, and more recently added urban food forest, which is super exciting that that is recently added. So riparian buffers are strips of permanent vegetation alongside a stream, lake, or wind, uh, or wetland. Um, and they have uh, the multiple functions. Uh, all of these agroforestry practices have multiple functions. Uh, but one of the functions of this is to stabilize the stream bank. Uh, windbreaks are strips of trees or shrubs designed to enhance crop or livestock production while providing conservation benefits. Alley cropping is rows of trees and or shrubs that are planted with agricultural crops in the alleyways. 
Silvopasture is the intentional integration of trees and or shrubs with pasture or livestock. So this is another word mashup here um, between um, so silvopasture, silviculture, and pasture. And here's a little brief um, example of silvopasture for you. Silvopasture is another agroforestry practice that is really hot right now along with forest farming. Um, where trees are providing uh, shelter and multifunctional benefits along with the livestock. So onward to forest farming. So forest farming is the cultivation of um, high value specialty crops under a forest canopy that is intentionally modified or maintained to provide shade levels uh, and habitat favor growth and enhance production levels. I think it's important to um, to highlight the intentional modification. Um, it's not just foraging. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, I'm forager, so therefore I'm forest farming. No, that's not the case. Um, if you are forest farming, you are intentionally modifying the environment. And here's two examples here. Um, you've got your forest, uh, you've got your mushroom operation. We'll be talking about both of these here as we, as we proceed. You've got your forest botanicals on the left and a mushroom uh, operation on the right. So some of the functions of forest farming, when we're talking about um, agroforestry, a lot of times I'm, I'm uh, uh, dealing with uh, NRCS or Department of Forestry or whatnot, and I'm talking about the functions of, of these practices. Um, but the, the functions definitely apply to producers and farmers as well, and how um, these practices are going to apply on our homes, uh, on our farms, uh, and how they can be um, uh, directly impactful to our lives and our properties. So how forest farming uh, can function on your farm uh, by reducing surface runoff and erosion, uh, by directly planting them, uh, increasing carbon storage, improving the air quality through the plants that are planted there, increasing biodiversity and wildlife habitat, um, stacking production, and uh, using underutilized land. Everybody's got a little piece of land that doesn't have anything going on with it. So within forest farming, um, you've got this plant husbandry continuum is what we like to call it. You've got your least intensive over here, which is where you're wild stewarding. And then you've got your most intensive where you are woods cultivating. And in between, you've got a wild simulating. We'll be discussing in each one of these a little bit more. And at the beginning, this is not um, considered to be forced farming, but this is where it initiates, is an artificial shade grown. And this is where uh, forest botanicals uh, can be in, in, intentionally grown under artificial shade structures. Um, this is intensively managed and planted uh, in rows, uh, in monoculture structures. Um, uh, they produce quick yields. It's very costly, very high disease, uh, typically disease infested, um, very intensively managed. Um, this is not forest farming, but it is one way of raising um, these forest botanicals in a non-forest setting. But this is not forest farming. <laughs> Um, but moving into the forest farming realm, woods cultivated is going to be your more intensively managed. Um, they're intensively planted and managed, typically in rows or beds. These can be uh, till, they can be raised beds, um, typically going to be highly amended. Um, uh, they can be uh, um, monocropped or uh, companion planted. They don't necessarily have to be monocropped, but in large scale producers, they, they more commonly are mono, monocropped as in this picture. Um, the root yields uh, can be low or can be high depending upon how they are grown, um, but they tend to be more natural looking than in artificial shade grown structures. Uh, and they're definitely less expensive than artificial grown structures. Uh, wild simulated is, is what we practice here on my farm. Um, you can supplement wild stands by manually planting extra stock. Um, this is typically in a polyculture environment. And it mimics uh, natural ecosystems. Um, the yields are typically going to be less than they would be in a, um, in a woods cultivated sense. You can see how this is uh, 
very high density of a typically of a single mono, mono cropped uh, plant. Uh, whereas here you can you've got we've got highlighted here uh, ginseng for instance um, in a polycultural system. Um, the roots are going to look more natural, and you can typically get a higher um, higher uh, price point for them when they look at, look like they've been grown in a more natural environment. Uh, and it's a very cost effective way of growing. And it's a very common way of growing as well, uh, low input on, on time. Uh, wild stewarding is going to be your low, your your least um, expensive and least time input as well. And this is where you're sustainably managing wild populations, but you do still have the intentional input that you're putting into it. Um, you're typically going to be collecting wild seeds um, and reseeding or replanting by rhizome division or just seed collecting and planting out. Um, your root yields are typically going to be lower, but this is going to be your most natural looking uh, roots that you're going to be getting. Um, again, this is going to be your least input, um, least um, get back off of it, but it is a, a very rewarding way of, of managing your woods as well. So design considerations. Uh, anytime you're forest farming, you want to consider what your goal Anytime you're, you're farming, period, of course, you want to consider your goals. Um, but with forest farming, um, what are your goals with forest farming? Is it species preservation? Is it income generation? Is it lot utilization? Uh, why do you want a forest farm? Um, uh, always think about what your goals are and work backwards from there. Um, shade percentage is something you really want to take into consideration when you're thinking about your site selection and design considerations. Your shade percentage, your moisture uh, percentage. Um, your companion plants are incredibly important when you're um, considering where to plant and what to plant. Uh, your overstory, middle story, understory, and your invasive species that you have present. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those as we are uh, discussing individual species in just a few moments. Uh, slope orientation is important. As you're looking at north and east facing slopes, you're going to have more moisture retention and cooler um, cooler uh, winters uh, than you're going to have with uh, south and, and west facing slopes. Um, and then access, especially if you're looking at mushroom production, um, those logs are heavy. Uh, if you're looking at getting in there and, and messing with them on a regular basis, you want to have something that's going to be accessible and easy to maneuver. Um, if you're looking at ginseng production, maybe you don't want to have something that's going to be super accessible as far as theft is considered. Um, so think about excess as you're, as you're considering your, your sites. Site selection, um, starting off on the right track. Um, just like when you're, you're planning your garden, you want to pick the right spot for success. Um, your light, again, your north and northeast facing slopes um, are going to give you um, the best moisture retention, um, but your light, 75% uh, shade is going to be a good goal to go for, and dappled light uh, is going to be your primo for most of your forest botanicals. 75% uh, is not going to be best for all, but that's a, a good roundabout goal to go for. Uh, soil, most of your forest botanicals are going to be uh, aimed for rich, moist year round, um, high in organic matter. Um, I would not go um, too acidic with most of them. Uh, go for more of a neutral pH. Um, calcium needs vary. Certain forest botanicals like higher calcium content than others. Uh, I mentioned calcium just because uh, ginseng in particular really is a calcium loving uh, forest botanical. Um, good airflow is very important. Um, you can get into some disease issues and um, mold and whatnot if you don't have adequate airflow um, and with mushrooms as well. Um, and water drainage. Um, you don't want wet feet on most of these, um, these forest botanicals, but you do want some good, good moisture retention. So companion plants, when you're talking about forest botanicals, um, some good indicator species are going to be mayapples, wild ginger, um, maple, tulip poplar, trilliums. Um, maple and tulip poplar in particular are two ones of note because as they drop their leaves, uh, their leaves uh, have high calcium content in them. And as they um, 
uh, disintegrate in compost, they uh, naturally add calcium to the forest floor, uh, which gives you some of the nutrients that you need for some of these forest botanicals. So think about, uh, look at the overstory when you are walking through your forest and considering sites. Uh, there's some good ones to keep an eye out for. Um, I, I encourage people to spend a good uh, season or two walking through their forest and looking at what's coming up in the spring. You're going to see your May apples in the spring. Um, you're going to see your, your trees leaving out throughout the year. Just uh, spend a good uh, few seasons just walking through your forest and identifying what species you already have present in your in your forest. And that will be a really good indicator as far as uh, what will work well in your forest moving forward. All right, everybody's worried about um, predators. Um, next few slides, I'm going to talk about some of your common predators. Uh, turkeys are one that uh, as a as a mushroom forager, um, and again, foraging is not necessarily forest farming, but it is definitely an aspect of, of um, making the most out of your forest. Um, but uh, wild turkeys are one that uh, really, that they, they eat berries uh, off of your um uh, for your forest crops, but they really love uh, morel mushrooms, so to speak. Uh, they really love the mushrooms and they will uh, eat voraciously off of them. Um, but uh, keeping turkeys at bay is is a really tricky one, but just know that they are present. Um, uh, hunters are, are one of the few ways of deterring uh, turkeys. I hate to advocate for hunting, but um, that's a, a slide in here that I, I really just find humorous. Um, Deer are one that um, is uh, fencing. Deer are will eat your ginseng. Deer will um, eat your a lot of your forest botanicals. Um, a fencing is a really good option for deer. Um, uh, little caging systems will work for deer. Um, there is is a big issue with a lot of the forest botanicals. Um, voles are one that we are having a huge issue with on our farm right now. Um, live trapping uh, is an issue is one option. Um, owl houses are an option as well. Voles will eat the roots uh, off of uh, ginseng and golden seal. Um, they will eat the berries. Um, they will strip um, bark off of logs, as will um, chipmunks. Um, they will, um, chipmunks will also, um, uh, or, they, or chipmunks and squirrels both are a big issue with with, uh, with mushroom production and stripping bark and eating the, and eating the mushrooms. Um, if you see snakes out in the woods around your patches, I encourage you to leave them. Um, they will help with rodent control. Um, if you have cats around your property, leaving them out to help with rodent control, um, it, they really help a whole lot. Uh, natural predators are a good way if you have hawks on your property. Um, just encouraging natural predator is, is a good way for rodent control. Um, humans are a big one um, predator when it comes to um, ginseng and special botanicals in particular. Um, everybody's seen the uh, gold hunter, not the, I can't remember exactly what the, what the TV show is, but everybody's familiar with the, the ginseng harvesters and uh, everybody's got the green gold in their head, so to speak. Uh, painting uh, the purple on your property, um, not being too vocal about what you have growing if you're concerned about it. Um, no trespassing signs. Um, and um, just it, using precautionary measures wherever you can. Um, we are here on our farm, we do have no trespassing signs up. We are very um, open about what we have growing here because we're an educational farm. We've never had um, uh, anybody come out and poach, but we know a lot of people who have had issues with poaching, unfortunately, and that is a risk that you run, especially with the high value uh, forest botanicals. Um, but I think that the more people who are growing it, the less risk that there is. Um, and the more, uh, more people are growing it, the less risk there is on wild populations as well. Um, but that is something to take into consideration as you're growing high value forest botanicals. Um, and I think just having them in secure areas, 
Um, cameras are always a good option as well. Uh, just taking that into consideration and being aware that that is always um, a risk with high value botanicals. Onward to the botanicals. <clears throat> we'll briefly discuss ginseng, golden seal, um, the cohoshes, and Solomon seal. Uh, American ginseng, um, it does like um, rich um, hardwood forests, uh, but will grow in drier sites as well. It does like um, high um, organic matter, uh, high calcium soils. Uh, it's in high demand in Asian herbal markets. It's used in traditional Chinese medicine as an adaptogen. And you can see the range in which it grows here on this map. So I mentioned that it was an adaptogen. I'm not going to get too much into uh, exactly what it's used for, uh, but site selection, um, this is one that uh, roughly 75% shade. It does like moist conditions, but not wet. Um, it does like well during moist conditions, uh, high in organic matter, high calcium. If you're amending the soil, um, you're going to use about 2,000 pounds of calcium per acre. I do, if you're going to get into soil amending, uh, I encourage you to test the soil beforehand. Um, this is one that uh, if you're looking for a good site, uh, do look for tulip poplars or maples. Again, when the leaves fall, they do um, contribute to the calcium in the, in the soil. Um, I will drop in the chat. Um, well, I'll do that after afterwards. I've got uh, on uh, our blog, one of the few blog posts I've done is a, a wild simulated ginseng planting. I can uh, share with you how we do that here on our farm. Um, uh, <clears throat> there's a few diseases, uh, blight and root rot that can affect it. Again, voles are one of the um, voles and deers are two of the primary predators that you've got with ginseng. Uh, propagation, you can go with seedlings or you can go with stratified seeds. If you're purchasing seed, do make sure they're stratified or else you'll be waiting um, a, a while for the seeds to come up. Um, uh, and then the seeds, you can plant those to a half inch to an inch deep, or you can just stamp them into the forest floor and then cover, back, cover them back up with um, the forest floor duff. And fall is the best time for planting with them as well. Um, with uh, stratification, um, yeah, uh, you want to let um, ginseng seeds dry out. You want to keep them moist, uh, keep them in a moist medium. Um, you can um, keep them cool. Uh, oh, and ginseng, another thing with ginseng, uh, I, I encourage you to recommend is check your state regulations on ginseng harvest as well. Uh, each state has ginseng regulations. Um, and for Virginia, I'd be, I'd be glad to share uh, the ginseng regulations uh, with that uh, in the chat as well. Um, here's some instructions on stratification. Uh, and I'm glad to share this presentation with you, Nikki, if you want to share that with people as well. Uh, here's the ginseng life cycle. Um, you can get up to uh, typically four prongs later in its life. Uh, you do want your ginseng to be at least six years of age, and I will share with you how to go about determining age. Uh, ginseng has what's called um, scars, um, neck scars on it. Uh, it gets one for every year of its life, so it's pretty easy to be able to determine the age of a ginseng uh, root uh, based on these root scars or neck scars. Uh, golden seal. So it, it will grow in similar conditions, ginseng, um, in bottomland hardwood florists, um, high in organic matter. It's another one that's in high demand in herbal markets. Um, slugs are a big, um, big issue, nematodes. Um, it's got a few diseases to it. Rhys it's easily propagated by rhizome division and root cuttings. Um, you can propagate this one by seed, but honestly, it's so easy to do by root cuttings and rhizome division. I highly encourage just going that route. Um, it, 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 it grows pretty fast, uh, way faster than ginseng. Um, doing um, root cuttings. Um, normally if I was in class sitting, I'd be like, who's done this before? <laughs> Raise the hands. <laughs> um, but I can't see anybody but Nikki right now. So 
<laughs> um, but here's an example of how to, how to go about doing that. <laughs> it's pretty easy uh, and very rewarding. It's a it's a great way to um, to expand your patches. If you have some naturally occurring patches on your property, I encourage you to uh, propagate off of those. Um, same with the rest of uh, or many of these other botanicals that I'll be discussing. Uh, black cohosh is one of my best friends right now. Um, uh, it's another one that really enjoys um, rich uh, hardwood forests. Uh, it likes uh, high organic matter in deep soils. Um, it's another one that's high in demand at the herbal markets. And like I said, it's one of my good friends, uh, menopausal years right here. So. <laughs> It enjoys partial sun, dappled shade. It can tolerate a little bit more sunlight than some of these other botanicals. Um, it does like uh, moist, well-drained soil. Um, rhizome division, the root cuttings are another good application um, meat with this one. Uh, it's a little bit more on the medium growing side. It's not as fast as the golden sill, not as slow as the ginseng. And as you're looking at the leaf on here, I wish I had a better picture of blue cohosh. Uh, so we've got black cohosh and blue cohosh. Um, the black cohosh has more of a finer serration to the leaves and the blue cohosh has a little bit more of a rounded leaf structure. They're both good for um, women, women's herbs, uh, both rhizome division for propagation and both uh, specialty herbs um, in demand. Uh, blue cohosh is a little bit more finicky as far as where it will grow. Um, Black cohosh, if you're in like in, in the triad area, it's a little bit more prone to the triad area than the blue cohosh is going to be. Uh, Solomon seal, another one that loves um, organic matter in deep hardwood floor, uh, forests. And it's got um, a wider um, range across the U.S. where it grows. It's one that you'll very commonly find in landscaped yards as well. It does have um, a few more lookalikes, in particular, false Solomon seal, which is more of a harsh. Oh, no, Stash, we're, I'm, rhizome we're, division. We're, we're losing you a little bit. You're um, cutting in and out. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, no. Can you hear oh. me okay now? Um, I think it might be me. So I'm going to make you co-host and I'm going to try. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yes, it might be me. So I'm going to try to make you co-host okay. <laughs> co -host and to make sure that the re recording here is a better quality and... And then I'm going to pop out and try to pop back in, but let me just make you okay. co-host. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to continue on. <laughs> um, Solomon Seal um, can grow in full sun as well. ways to um, um to um look at it and determine if it's um false solomon sill versus uh true solomon sill um the underside uh, there's a few few different ways one is going to be the flowers on solomon sill are very oops are very different um you can tell the blossom on this one is um is more of spiky versus bell shaped. Um, the berries look very different. Oh, I keep going the wrong direction. 
And then the underside of this leaf is going to be more um, just straight green versus uh, a little bit lighter color on true Solomon cell. So there's a few ways to determine um, that, but uh, there's still going to be alternate leaves. And they look do look very similar. They're called false for a reason. Um, and then the berry set is at the very end here versus going to be set up underneath where the flowers are as well. Um, but uh, both you can find in, in landscaped yards. Um, it's a very beautiful, very beautiful plant um, with medicinal properties to it. So opportunities in um, in forest botanicals, um, there it's growing. Uh, there's a lot. Um, I'm just focusing on Southwest Virginia just because that's where the base of where I work is. Um, but there is a growing demand for forested, uh, forested for forest grown um, botanicals right now. Um, many of them are wild harvested and it is a big industry. Um, there is a lot of pressure on these forest botanicals from wild harvesting. A lot of them are becoming threatened or at risk uh, because of wild harvesting. And there is a great need for people to start um, production of them to reduce re reduce pressure on wild populations. Um, there's also the cultural connection of them. Um, and many people have ideal growing conditions on underutilized land. So it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to get into growing them. Um, some of the challenges is that a lot of these plants are slow growing. Um, oftentimes the roots are small. Um, and wild populations, uh, there are declines from over harvesting and habitat lost, and that's part of why we need people producing them. Um, prices are um, can be low um, based on wild harvest models. Um, farming, and I'm just being real with you, <laughs> uh, farming and processing, uh, processing can be labor intensive. And some buyers have large uh, volume minimums. Um, and here's an example in 2024, some of the uh, price points for some of them. Now, I will say that the price points have gone up on a lot of these. And um, I am going to share with you about the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub um, that ASD has in Duffield, Virginia, um, where we work with buyers um, to uh, leverage small producers and harvesters uh, to increase their their um their power together to be able to accommodate to some of these larger buyers and be able to get much higher price points. Um, so I'll share with you a little bit about that in a little while. Um, but here's some of the challenges that people get into, but for something, especially for wild simulated where you have very little input and time into it um, for something that you can be, you know, once or twice a year, be passively putting into, it's not a bad idea. Um, so some of the other things that you can be exploring outside of forest channels are mushrooms um, or mushrooms are something that's very close to my heart. Um, uh, you can wild harvest or you can cultivate. Um, and uh, wild harvest, and um, I'm in Virginia, Nikki's in Virginia, so in the state of Virginia, you do need a permit to sell wild mushrooms. Um, and you feel free to reach out to me if you want to learn more about um, how to go about getting a permit to sell. I do teach that class as well. Um, so some of the options you have are chanterelles, oysters, lion mane, reishi, turkey tail, on and on and on. Um, cultivate some of the ones that you can cultivate are shiitakes, oysters, lion's manes, uh, not reishi. Uh, reishi is what that should say, turkey tails and wine caps. Um, I've cultivated all these. They're um, a lot of fun, super rewarding. Um, here's some morels on the side I harvested a uh, year before last. Um, super tasty, ready for morel season to kick in. Um, some of the, the considerations, if you're thinking about, uh, this is my little boy when he was little, helping with some um, uh, mushroom totems, um, trying to anyway. <laughs> um, uh, when you're considering mushroom cultivation, uh, you want to take into consideration uh, shade, airflow, access, and moisture. Um, and then some of the ways that you can grow are on logs, totems, and mulch. Um, on logs, that would be more um, like shiitakes and oysters, potentially lion's mane. Um, totems would be more uh, probably lion's mane, oysters, and then mulch would be more wine caps.
shade, you want to have um, a good percentage shade, I would say probably, um, you know, 70 to 90% shade, good adequate airflow, um, uh, access, again, these logs are heavy and just being able to go in and check on them on a regular basis or being able to go in and um, and either dunk them or water them, whatever method of, um, of making sure that they were um, giving the moisture that they needed for fruiting. Uh, you need, need to have regular access to them and then the moisture content. And how are you going to get that moisture to them to encourage fruiting or considerations you need to have? Other edibles to take into consideration for uh, forest farming, and there's um, syrup or sugar, and that's not limited to maple. Um, you could do um, 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 sycamores. Uh, sycamores will give you like a butterscotch type flavor to them. Um, you can do, um, oh gosh, my brain just farted out. There's a ton of other trees that you can tap. Uh, for sugar though, depending upon the season. Um, Backyard Sugaring is a really good book to look into for that. Um, ramps are a really good one. And contrary to what people will say, you can grow those in a lot more areas in the mountains. Uh, we grow them here in the Piedmont and they, they are thriving surprisingly. We've grown them for about seven years now. Um, pawpaws are a uh, delicious one. If you've never had a pawpaw, I highly encourage you to reach out to somebody who uh, has them on their property. They are um, our largest native fruit. Um, and they are absolutely delicious. Um, wasabi is one that is not native here um, that I encourage you to explore with um, with um, uh, cautiousness uh, to make sure that it doesn't go wild. There is still some uh, trepidation within the community about how to go about proceeding with wasabi, um, but that is one to consider exploring with forest farming if you have water on your property. Indian cucumber is one that's not often explored that I think that is uh, underutilized and uh, ought to be explored more. Spice bush is one of our natives, and there are others to explore as well. Um, so there's lots of opportunities under the forest canopy. Um, as far as resources available to you, if you're not familiar with the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition, uh, I encourage you to look them up. They're a free organization to um, join. Um, you can become a member for free. There is also a uh, upcoming Gather to Grow Forest Farming Conference uh, that's coming up in just a few weeks. Uh, it, it, it's, it's in March in, in Roanoke, uh, Roanoke, Virginia. Um, but the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition, um, they've also got uh, ah, so many things, um, great resources. They've also got a YouTube channel that has a ton of videos um, on everything you can imagine, forest farming, um, that I highly recommend checking out for further um, uh, nerding out on forest farming. Uh, forest grown verification by United Plant Savers is uh, instead of organic um, certification, uh, forest grown verification is one to look at. Uh, it's uh, organic certification is kind of hard to um, substantiate when it comes to forest farming just because of the, the impact. But forest grown verification is one that seems to be gaining a foothold, uh, in particular with buyers. Um, uh, Mountain Rose Herbs, for instance, has a, a ginseng leaf that is uh, forest grown verified. Um, but you can uh, learn more about that on United Plant Sa Savers website. Uh, there's a grant opportunity available, a uh, catalyzed agroforestry grant program. Uh, this is a pri privately funded um, grant uh, through the Edwards Mother Earth Foundation. Uh, you can, uh, the ABFFC, the Appalachian Beginner Forest Farmer Coalition, you can learn about that on their website, um, appalachianforestfarmers.org backslash EMEF. Um, the deadline is coming up for that soon. It's coming up in spring. Um, so I would suggest you know, checking that out. It is slightly competitive. Um, it's more competitive for the silver pasture than it is for the forest farming, I believe. Uh, but it is a competitive grant. Uh, the government is not involved in that one. So if you have any trepidations about, you know, grants and whatnot, uh, know that this is a privately funded one. It, it, it does accept all agroforestry practices, and it's the only one out there right now that does. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, and just real quick before I go into Q&A about the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub, if you are in Southwest Virginia, 
um, and uh, curious about how to connect to um, buyers or how to aggregate your um, your forest botanicals, um, the Appalachian Harvest uh, Herb Hub is an option. Um, it is a full service, um, well, not full service. It is a it is a um, shared use facility, not a full service. It's a shared use facility um, where um, we provide training, uh, aggregation, and um, cost share services uh, for uh, uh, wild harvesters and forest grown botanicals. Um, so if this is an example on some of the uh, wild harvested average prices on the left, and then right here is some of the same ones um, that are going through the herb hub uh, to highlight like black cohosh, for instance. Um, here, uh, the dry pot price is going for about three fifty dollars a pound, and we're getting closer to $45 a pound. Um, so it's a, it's a huge difference on some, some of these that we're able to leverage the power of um, small growers and harvesters coming together to be able to fill larger orders with some of these um, or, uh, buyers. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great program, a uh, great facility. Uh, Robin Suggs is our procurement manager. I'm glad to connect you with him if you have any uh, questions, comments, or anything of the sort. And i uh, love to stay connected with you. Um, you can, my email, my phone number, um, if you'd like to donate to our program or anything of the sort, you can follow us on any of the above channels. And with that, I'm glad to take any questions. Oh my gosh, I have a ton of questions, but I will defer to the other two <laughs> here online. I have a ton of questions there on the chat, <laughs> ready to just hit enter. But Robert and Jessica, do you guys have anything this to ask Stesha or any questions? That was a lot of information. So thank you. <laughs> that's, that's all the stuff I was asking Nikki about because I have, we just moved here in October and we have about six acres, but it's mostly wood. So my dreams of having a big garden are kind of iffy right now because I realize most of the cleared land that we have is over our septic leach field. And I've been told not to plant over that. So um, I think I'm just starting really small scale. I have my mushroom plugs. I've done some mushroom logs so far. I ordered some ramp seeds. Um, I ordered some pawpaw trees, but um, I'm, I'm really interested in the medicinal herbs. I'm interested in foraging. I'm by no means an expert. I'm still learning. So I was just wondering, do you know of a good place to buy things like golden seal or ginseng i mean i don't know ginseng might be a little more difficult but i'm interested in trying if you have any resources for that yeah 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 i sure do um let me see if i can pull up our our nursery selection real quick Give me just a second. Let me see. We do have a nursery um, um, site directory. It's it's still it's still in development. We're like as we find stuff, we add to it. So share it with me. Nursery. That's not it. Stock. So Jessica, I guess for you, your situation would be really forest farming more than, you know, raised beds or cultivation. Although yes. I Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I do have plans. I, I, all, I too have a septic field that I want the, it's the flattest place and that I want to plant in, and I'm, I'm going to use that for flowers. So, you reminded me I should probably stake that to keep that away from the chickens. And uh, yeah, we have plants. started running rabbits over ours. We planted it real heavy with grass and clover and run rabbits over. Oh, really? It for 
meat production. Yeah. Mm, there's another idea. Yeah. I do have rabbits, but the kids have kind of adopted them. They were supposed to be for me, but now they're like pets. So I feel I feel bad. I'm gonna have to revisit that. They kind of got put on hold. <laughs> I found I found our trees list. I'm just, where's our, our botanicals nursery stock? Ah. I look. Is let me the, let me see if I can uh, if I, I I Nikki if I email that to you can you yeah, send that out? I, okay, great. certainly certainly yeah we will find and that and that's true. Like I did look at your um, was it on the ASD site where we can what was I trying the the herb hub. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the planting. Stock. So it says buy planting stock and it said yeah, no, the, no products were found. Yeah, that, that's that's something that we started new last year, um, mm -hmm. just offering limited planting stock ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think last year we had black cohosh, a little bit of ginseng, a little bit of golden seal and maybe blood root. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have like a, a larger database of other um, uh, absolutely, Robert um of other nurseries that we can recommend that we've worked with in the past or that other producers have recommended to us um that we can uh, we, be, we share with producers as as they ask so um it's for some reason i'm having a hard time pulling it up in my massive google drive <laughs> um i know that on a seasonal basis um southern seed ex southern seed exposure they sell ginseng and um, golden seal on occasion. So you'd have to go to that, that, um, yeah, we bought that from them once. And I just saw Bloodroot on a site where I purchased it on a site called uh, Vermont Native Wildflowers or vermontwildflowers.com, something of that sort. Yes, yes, Robert. Did you have a question, Robert, that you wanted to ask Sasha? And feel free to type it in the chat if you don't want to unmute. Uh, no questions, but um, I'm an urban farmer in D.C. and we're looking to buy a property out in Maryland. And we have like a large uh, forest border that borders the farm. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about ideas to, to use that area also. It's been, it's been a great educational, you know, trying to get ideas to use that area of the, of the farm. Really oh, appreciate this. It's great. Oh, it's wonderful that you're here. Are you are you going to Rooting DC, which is coming up soon? Um, when is that? I don't know anymore. We we <laughs> used to present there, but we were not doing it this year. Um, but yeah, okay. that we go to to Anacostia and and there are lots of good presenters there too. But yeah, that's great. Yeah. Where I'll look DC, that up. Yeah, where in DC are you? I'm right in the city, Petworth. I'm doing a small urban farm. And, uh, wow, kudos to you. It's a practicing. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of the Future Harvest Beginning Farmer Program. Yes, yeah, wonderful. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I used to live in DC, so I, I, yeah, I want to know. I know where Petworth is. It's wonderful. Okay. Also, um, the forestry program, the Appalachian, yes. is that is that inclusive inclusive of Maryland also, or is it just mostly Virginia? Are you familiar with the four P program, um, Stasha? I'm not. They usually per they purchase from is, is that right, Robert? They purchase from farmers and they connect them with buyers. Okay. Is that how is that how it works? That's what I understand. They've 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 spoken at like VABF and. Um, farming conferences like that before and probably CASA or Future Harvest, no? Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, oh. I can include that link if you're looking for that connection for, because that's more Maryland, I think. Well, they also cover okay. Virginia, 4P. Um, so you can connect with them because, yeah, I think it's a great program. They kind of will connect ur even urban farmers to the customers that want it. And then it, it, it's like a buying club, I guess. So it might okay, be good for great. you. Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I have a bunch of questions too. Stasha. <laughs> Bring it on. All right, there we go. How do we measure our shade percentage? You just kind of look and you're like, estimate like that 75%. 
Yeah. Th so there's a few few ways that you can you can kind of tell. Um, I mean, I, I just walk into the forest and kind of go. Ah. Um, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> if you take a um a piece of paper or just kind of eyeball a piece on you know like a a ten by ten area on the on the floor of the a floor of the um the forest um and look at what percentage of that square has light on it mm. um and base off of that um if you try to look at the whole forest as a whole it's, it's overwhelming from that perspective so try to segregate just a, a, a piece of it mm. and then look at another little piece and and think of it in in pieces okay um and look okay. at it from from that perspective versus looking at it from as the whole forest yes and that that looking at the forest floor <laughs> instead of looking at the forest category, yeah i think is yeah look at there. the forest floor and just break it into like little 10 by 10 sections and say okay in this this area i've got um dappled light and it looks like i've got you know maybe a a, a you know x percentage you just you just got to kind of eyeball what you've got and sometimes it really does help to have like a white sheet of paper or something like that and just kind of hold it and, and, and judge around like that Great, you get an idea so do you eat do you also partake of your ginseng like you take it on a regular basis absolutely you grow it absolutely absolutely oh my gosh and why do you have so much energy to do all this stuff and fly to Costa Rica <laughs> and come back and present and all these wonderful okay and um, yeah. Do you sell ginseng at the Herbub as well or your other store? Or I don't. I don't. Store? Um, I did. No, no, we, we do, we do um, a little bit of ginseng tincture. Uh, we do a lot of value added products for, for our farm. We do a little bit of ginseng tincture. Um, I've done ginseng leaf tea uh, as well. Um, we harvest the, the, the leaves and do a little bit of root harvesting, but um, I'm, we're a lot of our crops. We're waiting until the kids are ready for college. Yeah. Um, they're, they're our college fund sitting in the ground so. that's right it takes so long to grow right yeah um stasha what's the name of your farm if i may ask eliana's garden eliana's e garden that's right yeah e-l-i-a-n-a -A, okay. apostrophe s eliana's garden and um yeah so the deer will eat all the ginseng because we definitely have a lot of deer yeah the, they, they, they it's tasty it's tasty oh my goodness. do you have any other uses for may apple it's for May apple, yeah, um, that the, the May apple does have medicinal properties to it. Um, I will share with you the herb hub. Um, the herb hub um, demand list. Um, as far as uses for May apple, I can't get into that. Um, I, I I don't have anything for you right there. No worries. Um, I I like the little fruits off of them occasionally, mm -hmm. the, the the May pops, um, but um, I I don't have the medicinal properties for for those. Because is that um, so that that name May pop that's different from the vine, right? Yeah, the may, may pop is, and that's where you get into those, those common names. They they can, yeah, they can go the into a few different, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. So it, it's the may pop on the, in the forest farming world, not the may pop passive floor. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and I, use, I, I use may pop for both of them, so. Okay. Um, and then, uh, do you want to tell us the purple paint law? Is that only in North Carolina, or do we use that? The purple what? The purple paint law that you talked about in your study. Oh, the purple paint law, yeah, I. I, I assumed that that was um, in other states as well, but it's 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 very very common here in North Carolina. Um, this is our our, our pub um, supply demand. Oh, nice. uh, for the, for this year. Oh wow! Um, to show you kind of what we're dealing with at the herb pub. Okay. And it's both forest botanicals and field garden botanicals. Um. <clears throat> But yeah, with the purple, it's it's a it's a um, it's a relatively. I think it's been around for at least ten years here. I've been seeing them for at least ten years. But you paint a a, a purple um, square rectangle on your tree about ten feet up, and um, it, it works the same as a no trespassing sign. Um, and it people. People know what it means, <laughs> and if you don't, it still stands in the portal. Oh, it's me. So. <laughs> I don't know what it means. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. And then which part of cohost do you use for the T's? The root as well? The root, yeah. yeah. And if I have applied to the CAGP, as you know, in the past. Okay, yep, that's that right. That's how we met. Yes. Does that application carry over? Or am I still being considered? It, or do it, I it, 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 it does roll over and I, ha and I have brought your name up. Okay, thank you. And so if anybody else wants to apply, that is the, um, the link that I'm going to put in the chat. This is a uh, a grant, is that right, Stesha, to help support the purchase of your forest farming medicinals or roots or whatever it is that you need to complete. And it includes a visit from somebody um, from ASD yep. or CAGP. Uh, yeah, the, it would be coming from Virginia Tech now. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, Virginia there, Tech is, is the lead on that now. Thank you. Are there any limitations to what you can purchase with that grant? Are there exclusions to it? Um, with that grant, it goes for um, um, seed stock, um, protection methods, um, uh, invasive removals, um, but it, it's 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 got to go back to getting the, getting the stuff in the ground. Mm. It doesn't include the fencing. <laughs> to protect from the deer does it yeah you can you can have i, I think that you can do like basic protection methods but you yeah. can't put up like a you know 10-foot fence around the entire property or anything like that okay. but you I, I think that you can include that wow okay. all right okay well thank you does anybody else have any other questions before before the time is up um just um, about the grant again you said it includes a visit from someone at ast is that before you get started or is that after to verify what you have done well unfortunately with this new grant cycle there was not no that the, they did not write in funding for asd to be doing site visits with this new grant cycle so right now is sitting the virginia tech um is is would be the one doing site visits um so uh, ian nichols is the lead on it right now um um, but uh, uh, Robin Suggs would potentially, uh, he's with ASD, would potentially also be working um, with you on that. Um, I'm, I, I've been pulled off of that grant. I'm working on a different one right now. Um, so I'm not really quite sure all the nuances on who's doing what, but I know that ASD is not doing site visits with it right now. Um, but the, the, it's typically the way it was working. I don't know how it is right now, but the way it was working was was that strong applicants were getting a site visit as they were being considered. Um, and th when they, it, it was like right on the edge of, if, if that was like a deciding factor. Um, they were, they were right on the edge of being, being yes, pretty much. Um, so it was either they were, were, were accepted or they were getting ready to be accepted is, is kind of how that was working. Um, okay. So. <clears throat> say I I'm in Tennessee. Do, do you think I could still apply? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's nationwide with the uh, all all states except for Alaska. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. But like I said, there's some nuances with with the changes with this grant cycle that I'm I'm not fully up to date on okay. because I'm I'm working on other grants now. I'm just helping spread the word about the grant. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I will tell you, there is um, uh, another webinar, let me pull that up for you, that asks, that answers a lot of the questions about it. It's Ask an Agroforester. They did a funding edition um, not long ago where this grant was included. There's three grants that we're working on right now. Um, and the CAGP, the Colizing Agroforestry Grant Program, was one of them. The other two are more for silver pasture. Um, but this does answer a lot of questions about the CAGP here. Wow, Stasha, you've given us a lot of information to digest and to check out after this call. So I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jessica You're welcome. and Robert. Yes, thank you, Jessica and Robert, as well, for being here and for all those who watched the replay. I hope you got a lot, um, took notes. It's very helpful. Thank you both. You're thank welcome. you. Thank you. All right, and with that, I will close the call and I'll see you on Saturday. Hopefully, uh, we have the culminating event 
is how to maximize your raised bed design. Um, live streaming here from Bethany Farm at 1030 Eastern on Saturday. So I hope to see uh, many of you then. And thank you again, Stesha. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Nikki. Thank Bye. you, Jessica and Robert. Have a good one. Bye-bye.